We've chosen to use Zoom once again in these uh, very difficult times to catch up with our next special guest on The Informer. He's the MD at the Leadership Sphere. His name is Philip Ralph. Philip, welcome. Uh, thank you, George. Great to be here. Um, how did you get into this leadership development role that you've been a part of for quite some time? Mm. So I, uh, as an 18 year old, I actually, I didn't run away and join the circus. I ran away and joined the police force. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I literally uh, joined the police force when I was uh, 19 and one week old. So looking back now, I was way too young, but anyway, I did. And um, yeah, so an 18 year career, you know, working in the psychology unit, um, working at the academy as a train the trainer, uh, working on police shootings and retraining police really got me interested in leadership development. And, you know, I guess as a police officer, you see both uh, the worst and the best of, of people. And I was fascinated by how people how people ticked. And I just wanted to do more of it. So I uh, I did quite a lot of facilitation and leadership development uh, within Victoria Police. But in 2000, I just uh, thought it was time for a change, and and so uh, left and and pursued a corporate career in in leadership development. So uh, that's a fantastic uh, uh, you know. Uh, opportunity to to cover some territory from a different perspective uh, can i just take you back into into those uh, days when you were part of the police force mm. the police at the moment in my opinion have been put into harm's way like never before they're being asked to do things that i don't know if you've ever trained for so what mm. advice would you have for the young men and women and the men and the women who in, in blue who do, more often than not, fantastic job. They are our only line of defence, if you think about it. And so often we, we, we give them short shift, and we shouldn't. What advice would you have for them uh, in these extraordinarily uh, difficult times? I don't want to say unprecedented because it's a word that we're tired of, we're exhausted of, but what advice would you give, whether it's here whether it's in New South Wales, WA or wherever, mm. they're being asked to do many more things than they were ever trained to do. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, George. And it is easy to be an armchair critic, isn't it? So um, I really appreciate the question. I think uh, I concur with everything you said in terms of it's a really challenging role and it's easy to you know, criticise them. But the advice I would give, and it's hard to put a wise head on young shoulders, mm. but mm -hmm. it's just before taking actions to take a breath and just create a little bit of space between what happens uh, in the field and what your actions or response will be. Sometimes they don't have that, that time, but even just a couple of seconds is just to pause and think and reflect um, before action is taken. And I see sometimes, and you know, some of the incidents that occur in the, in the media, and you can just see that, you know, the adrenaline surges, the primitive brain kicks in, the thinking part of the brain is taken out sometimes despite all of the training that police undergo. And you see things that probably um, people wouldn't be necessarily um, proud of or supportive of when they, when they watch the footage back. So I think try and develop a calm head as quickly as possible and just create a little bit of space in those incidents where, where practical. That's almost the sort of advice you'd give anyone who's tweeting these days, wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. For goodness sake, less less diploma by twi Twitter, by, diploma by Twitter, and um, or diplomacy by Twitter, and yeah, more 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 dialogue and more conversation. I think, and that was certainly you know during the the police shootings in the 80s and 90s, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in a project which really aimed to change the mindset from one of you know being the hero and potentially, you know, crashing down the door or trying to resolve the situation as quickly as possible is just to tactically create some space between what has just happened and, and our response. And, um, you know, police shootings went from one per month for 14 months to no shootings for three years uh, back in 1994, 95. I know that's a long time ago and there's, you know, a cocktail of drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things, but they were present back then as well. Mm. And it's not that different to leadership in a way. When something happens, don't respond immediately. We've just got to create some space between um, 
you know, what happens in, in, the, in the world and then how we respond to it. Tell me something. Um, in this day and age, you're, you're, you're talking to uh, uh, CEOs and others about uh, the challenges that they face. Do you, when you go to the corporate world, do you talk to them about having, uh, for example, uh, a, 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 an idea about um, preparing themselves for the day when they will need um, assistance in the time of crisis? So I'm, I'm virtually asking, do people call you and say, I need to set a crisis management plan up before we go into this new business or before we start this new chapter in our in our growth. Lord knows the worst time for crisis management is after the event. Absolutely. That's <laughs> right. And unfortunately, George, as you probably have guessed, and I can tell by the question that often we're brought in after uh, the crisis has already occurred. And uh, But those who are maybe thinking ahead, a little bit ahead of the game, really help us or, or, or ask us to support them to build plans around um, when things happen in the business and particularly personally. So it, I don't care whether you're brand new to an organisation or you're, you're a seasoned chief executive where we're people at the end of the day and we're subject to the same fears and concerns and frailties and, um, you know, the, the things that kind of go on mm. in our head and mm. the how do you prepare people for that and I think that's a really smart way to do it is to prepare people for the times when they do fall over you know the times when they do experience setbacks and failure and you know for some people they they, they go into a vicious a vicious cycle of self-destruction or at least self-doubt you know as a bare minimum um, I love asking that question in a you know in a room or with a leadership team you know who here and here who here has imposter syndrome or sometimes suffers self-doubt and without hesitation normally about a hundred percent of the room will put their hand up mm -hmm. and so if that's the case when they're sitting calmly and relaxed in a room imagine what what is their response going to be when you know the pressure is really on or shareholders are screaming and breathing down their neck or their name have just appeared in the newspaper or their organization so yeah lord knows in 20 in 2020 we've had so many disruptions what are the mm. what are going to be the top disruptive trends of say 2021 you need to know them now almost don't you well that's right and um yeah i think there are a number of things that we need to think about and you know the current pandemic is really uh we can either see it as a crisis or an opportunity it's definitely a crisis and i, I don't mean to minimize that in terms of the impact um, both on people and and to society but you know as an opportunity I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to reset how we think about how we manage people. And I think there are a number of uh, trends. And one of those is about, I think, being braver in how we lead yeah. our organisations and, and being more ethical. And I was trying to count up the number, and it's probably not a, something you should normally do, but I was trying to count up the number of royal commissions and inquiries and um, you know, processes that are ongoing at the moment, which are looking at leadership. And I, I read just in the last few weeks about, you know, the Rio Tinto example, where the Ducan uh, Gorge in the Pilbara. So 46,000 years of constant human occupation and um, the two caves were blown up uh, by the organization. And there's an internal review and the review said that uh, everyone and no one was accountable. And I think that's one of the things in 2021 that we're really going to have to focus more heavily on that um, what does accountability look like? What does ethical leadership look, look like? So it's as, much, it's as much a trend as a, as a call to action, I think. Um, it was interesting, George, in terms of that case that whilst they'd had an internal review and they, they cut $7 million off uh, the bonuses of the chief executive and and two of the executives who made the decision to blow up the, the two indigenous caves uh, they thought in setting up the inquiry they thought that would be the end of the story but the shareholders revolted and including 90 funds from the uk said no no that's not enough and so because of that immense pressure for more ethical decision making with accountability the ceo and the two executives will now be standing down um, very soon so I think that is a really strong trend. How do we how do we bring that to 
you know, modern organisations where we're both more ethical and braver. And they've got to understand that uh, if this is their CEO or the MD, the buck normally stops with them. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the buck does stop with them. And, and frankly, you know, if I look at, if we look at organisations, and, and this happened only just last week, I had someone on a program and they were talking about, you know, the bullying that they saw and had been personally, um, the re, you know, had received the sexual harassment the poor behaviour that we still seem to tolerate in organisations. And I think we just have to reset. You know, yeah. that's one of the trends I think next year. We just have to reset and be be braver and more courageous in calling out poor behaviour. Um, well, the, I think the example you're right. giving, I think the example you're giving is the AMP. They were talking about a, 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 their antics and the fact that they knew about it and they didn't shield and protect this, this member of the staff, which was quite shocking. Um, Mm. I, I think they've come to the party, but late. But it seems to me that you think that one of the most important qualities of leadership in 21 and beyond will be the ability to focus on the immediate problem and address it. Yes or no? Yes, I do. And I keep talking about braver leadership. What, what I mean by that is, you know, the inquiry in the, here in Victoria, we're very oh. uh, aware of a hotel inquiry. And I, I noted that one of the bureaucrats who gave evidence at the inquiry, uh, well, the commentary was around this in the public service, this, ex, um, this creeping culture of compliance, which you'd have to say is the opposite of bravery. Um, and one of the bureaucrats actually gave evidence to, he testified to say that he's repeatedly told by his own boss to stay in our lane. In other words, don't go outside our, our, our remit, don't, don't challenge, don't call out things you think are not working well, stay in our lane. And if that's the kind of organisations we're going to accept as a community, I think we're in, in real trouble. So that's what I mean by be more courageous, be braver, call out BS, call out stuff that's happening. You know, don't be compliant or sit back and be passive. Philip Ralph from the Leadership Sphere, thank you for calling it out and saying it as it should be. And we wish you continued success and uh, stay safe. Oh, thanks very much, George. My pleasure.